Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Active Inference Lab. This is Active Lab live stream number 27.2 on August 31st, 2021. We are a participatory online lab that is communicating, learning, and practicing applied active inference. You can find us at the links here. This is a recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so that we can improve our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome here, and we'll follow video etiquette for live streams and see who joins us. The short link is the calendar of live streams of the past and future, and we did choose 28 um, paper, but didn't update this slide, so check the link for next week's paper. Today in 27.2, welcome to Stephen. Greetings. In 27.2, we're um, joined by the two Stevens, as it were, <laughs> and um, we'll have a few questions that we can have slides for, the figures to go through, the paper itself, anything else that anyone wants to add. And then, of course, any questions that people type in the live chat as well, if they're watching live. So um, we can just say hello. And then we can uh, leave it to the author last just to maybe open it up or just bring what they were thinking about our second discussion here today. So I'm Daniel and I'm a postdoc in California. I'll pass to Stephen Sillette. Oh, hello there. I'm Stephen. I'm based in Toronto and uh, I'm working on social topographies and other spatial meaning making and hoping to find ways for active inference to shed light and all of that. And I'll pass it, shall I pass it to the other Stephen? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, good day to you. I'm, uh, I'm in Finland, Southern Finland, uh, based at the Technical Research Center of Finland, and I'm ready to answer questions. Cool. So again, uh, anyone who is watching can post a question, but then there's a few that we have lined up a little bit. Just one theme that stood out as far as selecting this paper was that it was applied. It was applied to making the kinds of objects and supporting the ability to have the internet and computers as well as just objects like pens and things like that. So how does this idea of helping us design physical systems, which ends up being our niche modification uh, activity as an economy, how do we help design, maybe if we're not an industrial engineer, but potentially people working on different kinds of projects that end up modifying the environment, maybe even influencing the same systems that industrial engineers use, or um, using some of the same techniques, but people who are just thinking along these lines and want to take what you translated one step towards application in your paper and then think about how it applies to their own work. So cyber physical systems, so the latest um, trend in this is um, for example, the, in, in the USA, I think it's called smart manufacturing, and in Europe, industry 4.0. And a big thing in this is the idea of having digital twins or digital siblings or even avatars. Um, and the idea of this is, is that uh, there's a the physical machine the physical process has got um uh, sensors on it and actuators on it and the sensors bring live uh, data to the digital equivalent of this physical process and through so uh, and then it seeks to optimize by seeing what's going on so at a basic um, or a basic level is, although difficult to achieve, is uh, predictive maintenance, for example. 
So if nothing else, at least to stop the physical process from um, malfunctioning or even worse, stopping. And there's no, um, there's no theoretical um, foundation for for these industrial innovations for things like digital twins. So of course, there's the, the theoretical um, background of cyber physical systems. But there's nothing to uh, anchor it with, in my opinion, that's very straightforward. So if we look at uh, life sciences generally, we know that um, evolution has had millennia of and millions of years to iterate to uh, develop elegant solutions so it seems sensible uh, at least to me to to look to the life sciences to see how nature's evolved towards least action and uh, of course a uh, free energy principle and active inference framework or theory uh, from the life sciences and are in their essence I believe very straightforward uh, as one would expect guiding principles in nature to be and applicable to human and artificial intelligence uh, to artificial agents so I believe it's useful to start from that basis and with uh, the free energy principle, this very straightforward idea of the um, of trying to minimize the information gap between the generative model and the world itself. So that's a, a very straightforward idea. And I know there's, um, you know, the the mass behind it is evolving all the time, and there's some debate and uh, courteous dispute about that. But the basic idea seems straightforward, so I believe it's therefore a good place to start. And uh, because this is such a basic idea, isn't it? minimizing the information gap between the the generative model and the world itself is this what i've said helpful in any way thanks for this i wrote a lot of it down steven slet yeah some really good points there one thing i'd be interested in to to know what your thoughts are is you know we can end up kind of adapting our niche through action as a kind of consequence of like following a path and these types of things and then we've got this kind of more constructed um sort of uh deliberative um organizational work um in which you know the in many ways the point of that work can be to construct the environment um in which tools will operate you know so in some ways we we use the tools of our legs or the tools of being in in the world and it can sculpt that niche and also we can be very much sculpting a bounded niche so i'm wondering my question is thinking about whether you see those that kind of distinction as being significant and how you see um the idea of like the free energy or the implications of the free energy sort of rolling out in the niche versus it the generative model for that niche being embodied in some way so you know so anyway so how much is there something when it's embodied for instance when you're talking about these um total quality management environments where someone is um trying to maintain I don't know, ISO standards of manufacturing or whatever. So um, I wonder what your thoughts are about 
that whether there's distinctions there in terms of active influence being particularly involved or you know the free energy principle more in, more generally so um well, what, so i believe that um that that the core of quality management is just a an instantiation of free uh, of uh, realizing the free energy principle through active inference and that's why i've you know put in the paper um but there's a bigger issue about um that in in nature things are evolving and uh as i put in another one of my papers in entropy that uh that so there are no things are evolving to some degree naturally in so if you just take predator and prey they they just it's evolved and if you're a, a beaver trying to get back to the lodge that you've built your niche construction as a beaver and uh, there's a, a links in if you're if you see in between where you are in your beaver lodge and there's a lynx a hungry lynx standing in, in your way then it's clear that okay you know th this is a, a predator and i should uh, this is not my as a as a beaver that's not my preferred observation whereas my uh, beaver lodge is a preferred observation but what goes on in uh, human needs construction and uh, ecosystem and uh, environmental engineering is not so straightforward so um, for example uh, highly refined food it seems to be a naturally to us like a preferred observation because it tastes good and so it, it makes life less strenuous and more stimulating so if the if the if the if the company making uh, highly processed food ready meals and so on it's it's acting within um quality assurance so it's doing in my opinion active inference to um realize the free energy principle but what its output is it subverts the free energy principle the externality it subverts the free energy principle because what it's offering to us as consumers it seems to be consistent with what we're evolved to do so it makes life less strenuous and more more stimulating but actually it's not good for our health in the long term of course now and then no problem but if that's all you if you live in a food desert if you live in a food desert we know there are lots of studies that show that unfortunately this isn't good for health so if you take one um entity at a time it can be conforming with the three energy principle um through active inference but its output subverts uh, the free energy principle because it makes our prefer our, our preferred observations instead of being good for us are uh, not good for us but we only discover that 20 30 years later so that's quite a lot to i have a diagram in um uh let me see there's a simple diagram of this in paper so the paper's called Yeah, it's called multi-scale free energy 
analysis of human ecosystem engineering. Okay. And there's uh, one diagram in it, figure one. So it's in entropy as well. Yeah. Shall I share my screen? Sure. Now remind me, there it is, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Are you seeing yep. multi scale free energy analysis of human ecosystem engineering? Yep. All right. So here's this diagram then. Um, there it is. So what what the so what active inference is leading us to is that from nature is that our preferred observation supports survival an unwanted surprise so an unexpected difference between uh, our prediction of what we're going to experience based on our internal generative model so an unwanted surprise so if the beaver's going back to its lodge it's thinking it's going to have an unhindered path back to its lodge and there's the unwanted surprise of a hungry lynx standing in the way and it threatens survival so that's natural free energy principle but through um human environmental engineering niche construction within that preferred observations can threaten survival so if my preferred observation is a comfy sofa a, uh, a large tv screen um, and a uh, device to change channels and do uh, gaming and then i can just order some food in it comes and uh, very tasty but perhaps not good for me i could be sitting down for 16 hours and then go go lie down for the remaining eight hours and these may be all my preferred observations but they're not good for me whereas the unwanted surprise that supports survival could be uh, messages that okay we should uh, not sit down for more than 20 minutes we should take uh, lots of physical activity we should eat um, make our own food and, and so on so what's going on in human endeavors which may individually conform to the realization of the free energy principle through uh, active inference can end up subverting the free energy principle outside of that productive act of that production activity and here there's some numbers okay so so a beaver could develop a new generative right let's see here all right so so in nature for a, a beaver the the um preference distribution for sensory inputs is for example plus 10 for the protective pond the lodge zero for woodland and minus 10 for a hungry predator but then if there's a bit of pollution you change like okay so now it is getting more complicated so there's plus 10 productive pond in clear water plus two protected on polluted water woodland zero hungry predators still minus 10 but then um uh or the example in this paper is in um some uh island nations very small island nations where there's um a lot of import of cheap calorie rich nutrient poor food and then the preference distribution could be plus 10 imported food plus two local food minus 10 no food even though there's clear evidence that the imported food is not good 
Okay, so there it is. Okay, so did that, um, did that lit up the hands? Yeah. I, I wrote <laughs> down some stuff as well, but Blue, welcome. Um, go for it, and then afterwards will be Stephen Slett. Thanks. So I, I was really curious about that subverted um, model, and, and like where you're maybe not optimizing like where where what your preference is is not optimizing for survival and i think that um you know you used it in the human context but i can think of many contexts where animals do a similar thing like a moth will fly into a flame and, and like a cat like i have these two kittens now in my house and they're like such trouble right like their curiosity like had my cat trapped in a box earlier today like i mean trapped like under furniture in a box which was like so bizarre so I, I mean i can think of of models where it's al always not optimal and so is, is this something that you think is uh, excuse me what was the last thing you said is, is this something that you frame as uniquely human because i can think of many instances of like non-human uh creatures that also have less than optimal preferences um no i'm not framing it as only human but what i'm pointing out is is that so for example the moth flies towards the flame but where did the flame come from and the cat's curiosity luckily did not kill your cats that's good um but they were going into boxes but where, where did the boxes come from so uh, are these things um of course, there, there are misjudgments. So all living things can um, make a big... Uh, and of course, with predators and prey, that for sure the predators are trying to get the prey, aren't they? And people can have... Um, and living things can misjudge the how far away the prey is and so on. And signaling systems can can get messed up and things. But with human beings the scale and the determination of um activities is is much larger so i don't there's a there's an american author whose his latest book i think it's called hooked um that uh he studied the, the for example the food industry for many years and um he his view is that there's nothing at all malicious going on but it's just if you're if you're in the in the uh a certain business you want you're trying to get as many customers as possible and you're trying to retain them and um with no no bad intentions at all it's all good intentions but then the effects are we discover it can be decades later that okay um this is what we thought was good is not so good Whereas in nature, if the the wherever the flame, suppose it was a flame from somewhere in nature, it was a natural fire. Well, the the natural fire maybe came from a bolt of lightning or something. It wasn't a determined effort over many decades of ever increasing refinement of a market offering. But uh, so there's more. So what I'm showing in, in the paper that you read, uh, that diagram about how the quality management system is like a, a general, is like an active inference system to reduce free free energy. So it's optimum for the organisation, but it can be suboptimal outside the organization so 
I think a general word to them for this is externalities. Just uh, two quick things. One was trying to explore that distinction between what is human, other than the fact that we care about us and each other, what is human. And I was just thinking of the ants foraging out there in the desert and they don't do margin trading or um, staking of their seeds to try to get fractional seeds and lending of seeds. It's like layer one seed gathering versus the higher order symbolic risks that the humans engage in. So that, is, and the niche modification and the scale among other factors. And then also what you said about misjudgment and the, the ability to misjudge, because a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, if um, let's just say traditional understandings of evolution are about fitness, then why, why do organisms fail? Why do all organisms not just maximize their fitness? Or if active inference is about reduction of uncertainty or using action and inference to reduce uncertainty, then why do organisms fail? And that's where the engineering perspective comes into play. Like things just do fall apart. And just because there is an imperative, whether to maximize fitness or to minimize uncertainty, the point is of the ensemble, there's going to be a distribution of performance, like a hundred engines. They're going to have some range of failure times, the LD 50 for some pharmacological experiment. So just because the framework has sort of a um, imperative, whether fitness or re uncertainty reduction doesn't mean that it's utopian or like Panglossian. It means that every single thing always works perfectly. So it's just cool points that you raised. But it, but also blue. Um, my my uh, I have imperfect knowledge. That's for sure. And I wouldn't make. Um, I I I I don't know enough. But maybe nobody does. Um, like what uh, was just said about ants. Of course, they, those words were coming for an expert, and I don't. I know next to nothing about that. And many of the behavior of many of all animals. I don't know. So for sure, it's not. It's not clear cut. It's not you know, one that humans are doing this and all other animals aren't doing it. Thanks, Stephen Sillette. And then, of course, anyone who's watching live. I think this raises some useful areas where we have spaces where it's very free energy minimizing as the main kind of um, way of getting a handle on things and the broader active inference. So for instance, when we're dealing with equilibrium chemistry, we're dealing with things which are often boiled or heated or made to be effectively dead, um, which is what happens in most engineering processes, in most food processes. I mean, the main thing that Coca-Cola does by putting sugar in is it makes a preservative. Some of them are saying to me, oh, why can't they just use water? It's an awful lot easier to, to, to distribute Coca-Cola than to distribute bottled water because Coca-Cola doesn't go off because it's got so much acid and sugar in it, it won't go off, right? So that what you've got is you've got these processes like you're talking about with TQM. And I worked in the pigment manufacturing industry. So we they were bringing in the ISO standards there around pigment manufacturing because they were inheriting a lot of these formulas from like 100 years previous. And it was all about minimizing and to make things reproducible and within tolerance. But you're always dealing with, you, you never want things to be organic. You don't want things to sort of to grow <laughs> in any place in the, in the process. You want it to all be, I suppose you could say, dead, right? But then what's really interesting, as you point out, is, okay, well, that might be what happens within the containment of the factory or the industrial process but it will go back into the world just like it will when it's out now as a product it will be used in an ecological niche and it will not be a dead niche you know that food that maybe isn't even biologically feasible or some of those chemicals are not there's no biological route to create them there's no way to create fluoride compounds biologically it just can't be done it has to only be done synthetically so what's your thoughts about that sticking with minimizing free energy more when you've only got dead equilibrium systems and then when it and what 
and how much active influence is involved in in that i suppose a first order is it only a second or third order and then what how things pop out into the niche in the community or whatever um i think this is um an open question i mean at one level maybe it's um in world systems theory this uh the the framing is that there are so now we're talking about whole countries rather than just um a company making something in one factory that that there are inevitably core i think in the terminology it's core countries that so it was the netherlands then britain then the usa now going towards china and then there are peri peripheral countries two levels of those and um the the argument is that the the development of the core countries is dependent upon taking from the the peripheral countries and um is this entropy being shipped out of the uh so if if you think of like a a factory as a heat pump and it's uh you're getting all the entropy out of the factory operations but then it's where's it going is it being shipped out of the factory and then is entropy being shipped out of the pumped out of the core countries into the rest of the world where things are confusing so i don't know i mean that's a bit of a, a broad sweeping statement isn't it so but maybe maybe on one level that's what's going on if there's if you if you have supply chains value chains and you push all the physical disorder out of those by eliminating all the information uncertainty then does that mean that the physical disorder has inevitably got to go somewhere else I don't, I don't know so uh, but maybe and then but uh, with but for sure there are externalities and the the, so the, inter, the interaction between levels is uh, because in in human endeavors it's uh, it's a shifting matrix it's not just a simple hierarchy so I don't know. Can I just ask one thing, just bouncing back off that? Is, I think it's an interesting. So in some ways, by by things sort of being taken out of the ecological niche effectively by putting in a, a process a processing plant where it's effectively dead. You know, you, you heat up your sugar your sugar cane raw material in, in a vat with sulfuric acid and it. You know, it's all it's all dead. It comes. It's, it's basically a chemical process that gets put into whatever food that someone's eating. Um, the consequence of having that dead equilibrium-based process, rather than non-equilibrium steady-state process, is that you're saying it puts a burden back on the ecosystem to try and reintegrate it in a way. So, in some ways, is it pushing entropy out, or is it just placing a burden on system to try and find a way to cope with something that it can't naturally incorporate easily into its niche what do you think blue yeah i'm not sure really i'm not um i i'm not uh entirely certain on this on this um transfer of disorder it's definitely very important. Like, for example, when people say, well, look at the miles per gallon of this car and then, okay, but where did the metal come from? Okay, but you know, it, everything is tied to everything and how we evaluate policies ultimately and choices are critical. And we do have to understand the relationships of um, the world's supply chains. But then I thought, well, it's not like there's a, like we're in a bomb cal calorimeter or a heat bath where there's a constant um, number or proportion of some kind of 
uh, negative activity. Like there could be an ant colony with of in a niche with very low nest mate aggression or bodies like there's organisms with low rates of cancer or in certain niches. You know, it's not like a statement of them across all patterns and times. But um, but then again, it was like so things do fail and there's no perfect state. But then at the same time, um, it's not zero sum in the informational game. It's not like we're trying to, it, because we're getting energy coming in. So can we kind of transmute physical order with information disorder? Do we have to like offload something to of another place physically? Does it bump up against any of the information limits or calculations or density of processing or storage? Will we not be able to remember enough? And then there's a catastrophic failure. I mean, there's so many components to your question. So I, I hope that we can all keep thinking about that because it's important at the level of like human activity with the supply chain. And it's also an important long range question. And if we don't have a long uh, range preference, then we're not gonna get there. Could I have one more bit in there without? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what's interesting as well is there's this question of because I don't really believe there is strictly speaking neg entropy as such. So in terms of, um, it's always kind of a relative thing, but it's a useful. It can be useful to think about it that way sometimes. But ultimately, it's always a change. So I suppose the question comes in in terms of how much is it around the ability to infer using entropy as much as it is about how you know how much is it to be able to use change in entropy or dynamics of entropy which can be a complex jungle niche you know it could be a lot of entropy change and a lot of stuff going on but it can be very healthy how much is that ability to dynamically get at the variational free energy really important for life um, whereas for us it's all about in, a, in a, at times in an engineering context is it's just reducing free energy per se as a, as a kind of an overall entropy term uh, which could be actually not so much about variational change it's just an overall general reduction in entropy I wonder what what your thoughts are on that One thought on that on the biological side is what's an industrial engineering relationship, ecosystem engineering relationship that has persisted for billions of years or millions of years or just long time, however you want to see it, the nitrogen cycle and some of the redox cycles in the bacterial uh, relationships, biofilms, the mitochondria and the eukaryotes. Now that's a shifting interface. But on the other hand, eukaryotes can totally count on that interface, the powerhouse of the cell, as they say, to persist. But then there's this other sense in which there is still a game theory and a failure mode and a, probably an interface of maximal uncertainty and the requirement for active sensing and trade-off costs. So it's, again, it's not like things, I think, work 99% of the time or 100% or 20% of the time, that is kind of how the chessboard is set up for the, for the, um, for it to even be a winning board at all. There's just niches where it can't work. Like there's temperatures that just, the population will just die at period. So is our engineering condition such that there is a path that's going to lead to what standard of life with what precision and, and uh, uncertainty for what distribution of people? Like, did we way, way overshoot? And now it's going to change back down to a different way? Or is there some critical path to changing the distribution of industry? Because it's not gonna be 
any way it was from zero to 2021, it's not going to be that way next year. Um, are you, do you, are you still seeing my screen or? Mm, I, I'm not. Could you reshare it? Okay. Right. That, this is a, can I reach you? Let me do that again. Right. This is a, are you seeing now? Figure one, meta ecosystems in the Anthropocene. Now we see it, yep. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is a paper. I'll, I'll go to the title. Um, so, knew the author or anything, but this is um, uh, not by me, by others. Nothing to do with me. I'm just a reader of it. Um, and one thing that they're saying that you can just so here this this is the same these are showing the same things but a is where human impact on migration based meta ecosystem it's it's just sort of implicit and on this framing of it they're saying that okay so we explicitly deal with the uh socio-ecological framework about okay so what are human beings what mental models of human beings got what regulations arise from that and then that inputs into it so let me go to the top so you see the title yeah on embedding meta on embedding meta ecosystems into a socio-ecological framework and this is a response this is just a short paper it's a response to somebody who replied to that no it isn't actually nope i'm mixing it up with another one there it is that's the title anyway so i'm wondering if um, that maybe that each each way of um uh making things has got its own entropy dynamics and that in this entropy and dynamics uh, there's physical disorder is reduced uh, information uncertainty is reduced but maybe that then pushes the entropy out elsewhere and then just doing more of the same thing it's just not possible there's a limit to it and, and with world um, systems theory uh, this is the basic gist of it that there are these core countries and there are peripheral countries that serve them and maybe that if there's one way of doing things you can't address the entropy that's caused by that by trying to do more of the same or trying to tweak that way of doing things. And maybe something quite different has to be done. And maybe there's something about, something to be learned from uh, landscape restoration ecology in this about that, about um, habitat fragmentation that, that uh, so, okay so here are these habitats and they've grown and they're thriving but these ones over here they fragmented they've split and there's there's nothing from them but dispersal so as people are dispersing from um parts of the world that are suffering from premature deindustrialization, that maybe there's something in uh, entry by dynamics that could be that well th this doing this type of industrial production this it drives out the entropy but it's shipping it out it's going out elsewhere and the entropy that is then um, in other places it can't be dealt with 
other than by some in uh, another way of existing. Does that sound in any way sensible? A very interesting area. Multiple levels of nested modeling and uncertainty and how informational and thermodynamic uh, aspects transmute into one another and arbitrage with one another or relate to each other. So it's really interesting area. And uh, one kind of thought on that, and again, to the fast food and things that might be unhealthy for us as, or policies that might be unhealthy in the long term for an organization. It, it made me think about being on a road trip and knowing that there was going to be not just the hyper stimulating experience, which has been argued in many other frameworks, like in reward based frameworks, which is what, you know, oh, dopamine, the reward molecule, reinforcement learning, reward learning, they'll already have a framing for how those products hyper stimulating lead to failure modes of complex societies via hyper stimulation. Okay, so that is sort of a common stance. With active inference, we can also kind of highlight the fact that those products have lower variability and that there's actually very bland foods that for reason of blandness that pe pe or like a TV show or something that for reasons of narrative or um, aesthetic, j just um, similarity, people will rewatch. I mean, even to videos that of types that people didn't expect. Why do people watch the log burning or the goop? playing because they're sort of like the um frontier of optimal foraging is about like how it's going to sound which is a very small thing to be resolving relative to the more um uh, deeper unsettling levels of information that could be revealed like someone else's um perspective of you or something like that so it's just interesting how we can actually as you point out like the supply chains are modeled on one hand by these cyber physical digital twin um, frameworks that need a unifying approach. And so on one hand, active inference does provide that, but then looking at the other side of the equation. So what you didn't discuss in our paper for these weeks, but where you left off when you start introducing the biological and the survival imperatives, then we can also have some new ways of thinking about how those industrial products through precision hacking rather than reward hacking end up leading to maladaptive behavior with or without reward incentivization. Are you, um, what are you seeing on, are you seeing my screen now a different, yep, birds. different diagrams? You see birds. Yeah. Generalist bird gap, specialist butterfly interior habitat but especially beagle so th this is another paper um i'll again i'll scroll up to the top you see the title um and, and it's making this point that uh landscape composition and configuration got into different species perceptions and so the first one's a human and then it's different species and as it's neatly illustrated there that the same the same place looks different to different species and so what i'm and the the kind of the terminology here is that there are patches habitat patches and they can be corridors between them or stepping stones between them and the stuff the other stuff is called matrix and I personally can't ever see that word or say it without thinking about the movie. So that is a bit of a problem. But uh, but in the, the landscape ecology, it's called the matrix. So this, I think this could be useful of illustrating that, well, okay, that so here's the road to the mine. These uh, from country, com companies built the road to the mine. They built the mine and they're taking the... The stuff out and they're taking it back to their country to um do highly efficient manufacturing with it and then they send a 
completed goods back and but then what's left um so if you just measure that in terms of gdp growth then the gdp goes up divided by the number of people and it appears that prosperity is rising but if if you look at it in this kind of view it shows that well there's a lot of blank spaces left be left here and uh if we think about it in terms of this uh restoration or regeneration it it, it's looking at it, it all of these because of course the the perspective of the human the generalist bird the gap specialist butterfly and the the beetle they're all equally valid and um so let me see what this paper's called yeah landscape ecology and restoration processes And even within the same physical overlap, one bug might be underground or in the roots or on the ground in the canopy. So even the physical micro niche that different strategies or individuals experience in the same spot in the matrix can be very different. So there's just such richness to this ecological thinking and it's just challenging to bring it into play in some of our cognitive endeavors but i think that is also changing rapidly so i've taken um uh, an ecological perspective in yeah We're doing one paper on meme ecosystems and rhetoric ecosystems by the end of this year, but it's not active direct, but <laughs> maybe it'll have some relationship. It could well do. Um, are you now seeing a, a yes. table, table one? All right. So what I've done here is I've uh, done this from a uh, ecological perspective and uh, well, you can see these terms, but one thing in uh, a restoration, ecosystem restoration, is mobile linking organisms. That, uh, that like birds and animals that can travel quite a long way, they can go, so after there's a forest fire, then animals that can travel quite a long way, particularly birds, they can come, they can fly and drop seeds and, and things like that. So this is a, an established uh, concept, mobile linking organism. And I'm pointing out that this is something that could be done in mobile factories. And then energetics, another key issue is that if there's no, if all the energy, if all the matter and energy are flowing out, then life isn't sustainable. And uh, of course, there we are. So I've, I've done that relating to my uh, favorite subject, movable production technologies. Okay. So, um, so that takes, I think this is decentralized systems, isn't it? That uh, on the, the second list. point that that was it that was the lead in the segue okay nice <clears throat> how about oh go for it um Stephen. yeah so i think this is the thing that if everything's so at the moment there's this uh centralization oh let's have a look at this i've got um I go again, so let's have a look here. Are you, what do you see now? Do you see a taxonomy? Uh, taxonomy and manufacturing distributions. And their comparative relations to sustainability. Yes. All right, so 
here they are. So there are distributed distributions and centralized. Um, and as we see, there's plenty of distributed options. And uh, then I compare them in terms of economic, ecological, social and institutional sustainability. And where I think uh, active inference, I've just started to look into this, um, that this agent environment systems and uh, at framing it as the, the agent has a generative model, that the world is a generative process, the sensory inputs are coming from the generative process of the world. And um, I think that this enables um, active inference to be linked to uh, ecosystem dynamics and that that what we've been well, what I've been saying before about this centralized distribution it um, it's super efficient and it's getting uh, engineering out physical disorder and information uncertainty but then maybe that entropy is going somewhere else and uh, maybe new information is needed to activate the more distributed options so do you think do you think that um that if if the only if only a certain um so if there if there is a predominant paradigm which in this case there is industrial manufacturing based on the 300 years old paradigm um that if the information about how to make things is all about that and how to improve that and then then does it become a zero sum game that if if so if it is shipping out um entropy like a heat pump out to the peripheral nations do you think it's a zero sum game if there is an alternative information so if nobody knows or there hasn't yet been uh, conceived an alternative then then is it like a, a closed system so in a closed system the entropy has it's if it's pushed out of one place it goes to the other places so is it is a is it a closed system is it a closed system if all the information is about one paradigm so is this like uh, for example does am i in any way coherent here it's an extremely important question and um you know socio-technical systems political systems tokenomics that last forever are these the to the uh, perpetual motion machines of the 2020s and just a new level of uh computational uh detail and flourish but the same kinds of fallacies and then um whatever the thermodynamics of the earth are our niche is finite and we've now made some potentially um whether or not the sum is zero or even negative or could be positive but is negative there may be informational and strategic games that um don't resolve like heat baths so they can't be understood with some of the at least most tangible physical metaphors that thankfully guide 
the evolution of theories that are first principle, like FEP, like Carl Friston with the wood lice, seeing the trajectory of a real thing, and that's based upon health and um, longevity. Blue? Yeah, I had a question about the table that you pulled up earlier, um, specifically about ecosystem engineering. And so I'm not sure if it's just like a term that I'm not familiar with, or like in, in terms of engineering, I'm kind of naive. So when you're thinking about ecosystem engineering, um, I, I, I equate that to niche modification, or like designing a system, like even, you know, you could design like a world system. So here it says it does not require overriding the natural evolutionary balance of equal equal ecological fitness. But like I think about like the human paradigm. Well, and blue. Could I just could I just uh, well, sure. I have interrupted? I? But that's movable production technologies. So what I'm saying there is that if you've got a movable factory, so a truck, if you've got a, a second hand truck with a second hand container on the back of it, it does not require overriding the natural evolutionary balance. So it's it's specifically in relation to, if you look at the top, it says movable production technologies. So so how how is that ecosystem engineering, though? Like a no, movable... no, it isn't. Yeah, but the point, uh, obviously, oh. this table is not clear. And it is my responsibility, it's not clear. I am the responsible for this, but so the the what is meant by this is because further up in the paper, it's pointing out that if you have fixed production technologies, so if you've got a big fixed factory, you build a load of roads, huge roads going to it, and so on, that involves a great deal of ecosystem engineering. But uh, a mobile, a mobile factory, it can just go over rough terrain. Also to uh, play devil's advocate against the author, the enabling function of a uh, realization of something, something physical that can be an ecosystem engineering agent, aka niche modifying agent, um, that it's going to have to be a niche modifying agent. So this is just sort of then connecting that to mobile organisms. So you have, quote, plants, aka factories that are planted. And then those can be like, they're not like trees simply, but they're planted. And so they have strategies not dissimilar from other rooted organisms. Um, but then you have mobile organi linking organisms. So it sort of connects that um, all the things that mobile organisms, like all animals do uh, and can do with what a factory could do ecologically blue so it just kind of makes me think about like what kind of biological organisms take their niche with them right like maybe a snail or a turtle like you know to take take a large component of like their habitat essentially uh with with them wherever they go the mobile technology made me think of that Yep, some people like to travel with uh, light, uh, you know, just the keys or something. Other people, full backpack every time. Stephen, Salette? I like this idea of something coming out of the factory, going into the space, and then things being secondhand, I suppose you know, third, fourth, fifth hand, because there is something there that is delivered. Is this, I mean, if you're going to use entropy, I suppose you could say low entropy kind of new new vehicle you know whatever it is and slowly it gets incorporated into the ecosystem it starts to get scratches it starts to get this that and you see in, in india you know people start decorating the vehicle you know the all this sort of stuff will happen over time as it becomes somehow incorporated into the niche i suppose you could argue so i think that's quite quite interesting um how that maybe starts to change the dynamic. I, I'm, I'm still not sure whether entropy is so useful um, term or whether it's some other way of looking at a metric. 
maybe something to do with pre-energy minimization as a as a thing but um but uh, yeah one other piece of that table that was interesting was there was multiple goals like sustainability and fitness uh so uh it it uh is not a univariate optimization we're not just doing reward or utility maximization we can choose multiple goals and we can have multiple human goals which is especially important for things that you know we care about but then this one of mutualism is interesting because a lot of times mutualism could be seen as like an outcome like the outcome of these two bacteria's relationship in the niche is a commensalism or mutualism or symbiosis whatever it happens to be but actually using this idea of the um the outputs like the observation states of a higher level bayesian model being like the priors on a lower level nested model having a goal of mutualism is implicit in the lower level model enacting that mutualism because you're not accidentally gonna metabolically coordinate through millions of generations and so this is kind of a, an interesting way where uh like we have to want to make it work because we're not going to accidentally make it work and get along. But that can be a, a hyper prior, like a, a belief about how things ought to be or how we want or prefer things to be. And then we enact policy along those lines. And um, by the way, I do, um, um other, uh, it's not in this. It's in, uh, by the way, in, um, in another paper, I do point out there are limitations to movable factories. So I'm not, uh, uh, saying that this is a panacea. But it's sort of like, like, let's just say um, cactus versus like a, a desert animal, you know, the desert animal, they have different ways of getting water. And so, but when we can design the system, we can do trade-offs. Like you could have something that's stationary, but then isn't just holding all of its own money because its money can be like on a digital system. So it can have some of the advantages of a stationary organism from an ecological perspective, like a tree, but then like the value of the tree um, could be protected in some other way because we have some other affordance and or that forest could be de-risked at a higher level because it's like, oh, each one of these is we expect to fail this many percent of the time or we have these quality control checks on it. Yeah, I think... Uh... A lot of thought is required about about these things, isn't it? It's. Uh, I don't think there's one big answer, but um, but at least I think one uh, good thing about uh, the energy principle, active inference, that it ties into action, and that ties into energy. So. This is good. Yep. When you're doing the thought experiment, pure uh, Gedenken, then it's like, can be elucidating. You know, imagine you're going towards the speed of light or imagine you have a, a physical mass of this size. But then there's no constraint, which is again, double-edged sword on some of these attributes that require action. And um, so that's, that's an interesting idea that it ties us to um active states which is pragmatic and useful but also interesting and then also one thing on the affective system and then blue you can ask anything was just we've talked also about higher order variables in organisms being kind of like affective states whether they were the valence like positive or negative or the anxiety or the relative beliefs of an organism um so just how do we design for when there's higher order states 
maybe even ones that be, could be considered affective either for people or for, for organisms or, uh, I mean, uh, organizations that have this kind of organismal structure. But Blue? So interestingly, like this is going to touch on what you just said, but also going back to what you said about mutualism and the goal like has to be mutualism. So, so I don't know, um, I, I really have to uh, contact the author of the um, 2020 paper, uh, Sims is his name, uh, How to Count Biological Minds, Symbiosis, the FEP, and Reciprocal Multiscale Integration, uh, which I have found um, very fascinating, but I would love to invite him on for a stream someday. Uh, the, the whole point of that is that there's like nested cognition happening at the biological scale. And, and specifically that paper looked at the squid and the um, Vibrio fissurei that like light up the squid in the, in the light organ. And, um, you know, in that kind of context, as in an industrial organization, there's like this nested cognition happening. Uh, um, and where it, the, the point of that was the goal wasn't necessarily um, mutualism or in that case, symbiosis. That that's not necessarily the goal, but but it, a bigger, grander organism was constructed out of the union between these two organisms. And so, perhaps in an industrial scale, that's also something that happens, right? I mean, there's different parts to the organization that'll keep it running, and you factor in all the supply chain things, and and so there's this nested hierarchical thing that happens, and, and something bigger. That, that has its own kind of cognition occurs as a result of this like mutual uh, beneficial relationship. We see the paper. The paper? We see the paper that Stephen just put up. Yeah, yeah. there's some, these, um, I thought it said in here, so I thought it said in here somewhere about yeah, there's different types of relationships. So mutualism is beneficial, beneficial. Um, and parasitism is beneficial, harmful. But in between those, there's beneficial and neutral. And um, there are several in between mutual and para parasitism. There are uh, several other states and i just remember that the one of them is beneficial and neutral if i could give a, a kind of random thought on that and why the informational sphere might have a different entropy dynamic than the physical like the electromagnetic spectrum that can have a lot of positive and neutral relationships like if someone's operating on two different wavelengths and one is only on one wavelength, then they can be like of mutual service to each other, or one could just be totally non-interacting because they can be overlapping in space and time at once. And one person might not even have to be aware of it. Whereas in the tangible, um, I guess most embodied one can be, you know, only one thing per spot that's zero sum. There just can't be two, <laughs> two atoms at the same spot. Or maybe, you know, two laws playing out in one territory. But informationally, there's probably a lot more multi-channeling and that might give enough room for practical success, if not ultimate theoretical answerings. Steven Slett, and then Blue. Yeah, this brings up a lot of issues. It's it's very fascinating. Um, I'm 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 curious. Um, sort of coming back to this idea, and I, I mean, Daniel mentioned hyper priors, i.e., things that we kind of have fixed. Um, I actually looked that up actually to make sure I understood it. But things that we have is very distinctive. And I'm again trying to compare these. Um, these types of um, environments where one where you've got an agent wanting or being able to just calibrate in amongst the noise and ones where you want to just keep it as clean as possible you know so and and the challenge is sometimes when you have a, a, a quality management system in those places so for instance i suppose one thing that comes to mind is the experiment with a rat 
that they used to have and they've had for years about having cocaine or addictive substances and how they would they only needed it have a couple of times and they would be addicted and it was seen as this kind of proof of principle about addiction and how it works and then the more recent work where they instead of putting them in a bare box and just having the cocaine or whatever they were being um sort of exposed to they were in a, a more ecological um box you know where there was things to do and they suddenly found that the behavior of the animal was very different they wouldn't necessarily become addicted in the same way because they would actually because they were in a better ecology now in theory the entropy has gone up there if we're looking entropically but for the animal they've been able to engage and and dynamically process that that's very different to how you would try and create you know a medical production line right you you want to keep it clean you want to keep it sterile um you want to have those sorts of things so i'm just curious about that that and then the danger maybe in in the biological system of this hyper prior say the, the some sort of kick or something that comes from food not having any other compliments around like like as daniel you know so there isn't other things so that just naturally kicks in like the reward goal which may be always there as a, as a default if there's not other things to complement it, it just it starts running the show and that could be part of how we get into these maladjusted behaviors that you were talking about i wonder what your thoughts are on that just quick point of clarification that's not what a hyper prior it is that's not a hyper stimulating stimuli a hyper prior is a, is a prior over another prior in a bayesian multi-level framework so it doesn't have yeah. to be accentuating or differentiating or extreme or maladaptive it's a general framework for the relationship between variables yeah well i was thinking it was more the hyper prior could give a it's a it's a, it's a fairly fixed prior isn't it? it's one which is a go-to solid prior and it's useful for being that does so just saying having that present hyper prior could be fixed or learned or learn okay okay but it tends to be hyper prior means it's quite accurate isn't it it's quite it's not fuzzy no. hyper is i think a spatial designation like supra not uh oh, okay. not in the extreme case hyper is only referring to the fact that it's a a, a parameter about another can, parameter yeah, an overarching so, so it doesn't tend to be hot or cold or anything it's just the general phrasing Okay, got you. Got you. So, but Stephen Fox, if you want to add anything, at, uh, and then otherwise, blue. Okay, we see the head. Yeah, so in now the effective system. So here. Here's my diagram. So in in this, um, so that uh, if it's a bit it's so small I can't see it myself. Um, that if there's the same uh, starting point, but um, of a generative model. So if the human being in human uh, robot interaction knows that um okay so i i'm i'm in the predict i'm human i'm in the predictive processing business that's what i'm doing and um and um so i've got prior beliefs and i have got uh, generative models then the robot can be um what does that say personas and scenarios for robot based on the humans uh well that's world view but generative model and human readable model of the robot mind that corresponds to that so that's um and this is in Aligning human psychomotor characteristics with robot and augmented reality. In this, th 
So, there's a bit of a model there. That's also very related to the Felix Scholler's paper, Trust as Extended Control, Active Inference, and User Feedback During Human-Robot Collaboration. Ooh. I'll put it in the I YouTube chat. I that one. I'll put it in the YouTube chat. But Great. Go for this one. Yeah. So that's... Um... It's all in the past experiences, physiology. So this is body memory in there. Personality, gender, culture, emotion, reasoning, and bio-cybernetics. So this paper, I'm uh, relating that to what um, how this can affect interaction with robots, exoskeletons, and augmented reality. There it is. we got here a few equations there it is but in the two as i point out in this that um you find yeah so in previous production literature the uncertainty of human behavior this is this is true. So in previous production literature, the uncertainty of human behavior has been recognized as a source of productivity, quality, and safety problems. However, fundamental reasons for the uncertainty of human behavior have been framed previously as a black box. So what I was trying to do there was relate it to, to open up the black box and uh, Frame it as an open box, and then fundamental reasons can be aligned with production technology to facilitate improved production performance. So that's as far as I've got with that. It's almost like for the uh, reward utility driven person, you can say there's going to be an increased expectation of performance. For the uncertainty minded, you can say there'll be a reduced variance. For the resilience minded, or for the reconfiguration minded, that there'd be an increased capacity to rapidly reorganize. So I think that we'll have all or none. Blue? So my thoughts kind of dated at this point, <laughs> but just going back to, um, touching back on to mutualism and, um, you know, these, these the electromagnetic spectrum, when you're talking about how like, you know, the signal can amplify, um, there's also like the possibility for the signal to cancel, right? If if the you know wavelengths are are the same and they're heading in opposite directions, it they just directly cancel each other out. And it, it kind of made me think of like cancel culture and also like the relationship between um, you know the parasite is is also like a nested biological relationship, um, even though it's not necessarily beneficial. But there's still this nested layer, like the, the parasite is unable to function without the host, of course. But um, the host embodying the parasite, like, is a completely different cognate, cognating creature. And I think about, like, the zombie ants, right, that um, are, I don't know if you guys have heard, Daniel can probably unpack the zombie ants a lot, a lot better than I can. But it's a, like a parasite that then drives the behavior of, of the ant due to some, like, rewiring of, of the cognitive process. Mm -hmm. So even in, in the parasite instance, there's still a greater cognizing structure. And, and going back to mutualism again, the, the other terms are, so commensalism is where one gains benefit while the others uh, it has a, there's a new, neutral, no benefit, no harm. And then there's a mensalism where one is harmed while the other is unaffected. So they're in between. So there's first mutualism, benefit, benefit, then commensalism, where there is a benefit, neutral. And then there's a mensalism where there's um, harm, 
a neutral. And then parasitism, where there's one is harmed and the other's benefits. I, I wonder if this has to do with the movement from maybe just it's semantic, but from sustainability to regenerative, because sustainability, it's like the sustain on the guitar sound or the bell, like let's sustain, let's have this car and sustain it or make it, it can be meant to mean more than that, but it's about uh, sustaining something that exists versus regenerating uh, means like we're going to have to be doing more than just persisting or stabilizing it that it has to be also actively having this process of uh of regeneration which always involves like multiple parts like bucky fuller saying that unity is plural and at minimum two so then now thinking about how from polyculture of growing crops to monoculture the green revolution and everything and then now oh maybe there should be the fish in between the roots of the plants and then the birds and then the mushrooms like this are these stable ecosystems that is what remains to be seen but some human modified niches like sourdough bread and things and beer have been really successful so maybe there's higher order combinations too that could be really successful and be very productive but um this is kind of a framework that helps us at least explore that so that's quite cool Was that um, remotely? Of course, it was. A, there was a launch. The South African um, Grassroots Innovation Program. They uh, did um, a launch uh, yesterday with five uh, lady innovators, and, and one of them was doing um, movable aquaponics, and uh, she, she seemed to have addressed. It's quite a sophisticated system, but it's all uh, it's all set up in buckets that, that can be carried. One person can carry the buckets. That's the size they are. And then you build up the the farm by different just having the, the number of the different the more buckets you get, the bigger the, the aquaponic farm. So that was interesting. And then again with the physical zero sum and then the electromagnetic or informational or financial non-zero sum um if the overlapping is just given the tools that already exist in the ecosystem that you find yourself in like you're dropped on survivor island you still may be able to find some synergies most of them you won't know but they're over long time traditional ecological knowledge can learn about some medicinal combinations and uh oh these two should be combined for the boat and these kinds of things but design and this is related to what steven said about the product being plugged into another external niche and what you wrote about the cupboard being attached to the wall like we could design some pretty minimal pieces that might really scaffold like you build a trellis and then something grows within it so the engineering might not be huge to connect a few pieces that have a, a latent capacity to work together. Yeah, the, the word you use there, scaffolding, has that got any, um, I've, I've, of course I've heard it before, but does that have any basis in nature to your knowledge i would certainly say so um from the spicule structures like in bones and the way that um physical structures are scaffolded to um embryogenesis and the developmental scaffold scaffolding of um, the uterus and the core caretakers and different insects and humans and the family and so i think there's the cultural scaffolding and then all the way down to the microstructural cytoskeletal scaffold for scaffolding enzyme complexes that then can do very efficient things too. 
Yeah, this is interesting because the problem with uh, the challenge with um, so-called grassroots entrepreneurship and innovation is scaling it up. That's the, the challenge. That's, that's what was said yesterday. That, that's what was said in India. There's this problem that solutions are developed and they, they work, but they at best stay where they've been in the village where it's been developed. It sort of just stays there. And so scaling up, and it's an um, open source um, would, it's, well, there it is, the technology is there, isn't it? Open source ecology, it's uh, it's possible to put all engineering designs and bills and materials and um, uh, methods of work and all on the internet where anybody can access it, but still things are not scaling up. Thanks, Lou. So I think about scaffolding um, in, in terms of uh, like neural systems, but also in societal systems. In the brain, like my PhD work was um, focused on finding a scaffold that will promote the growth of neurons across um, ac across a lesion. And so when you, when you have a traumatic brain injury, the, the glia, which is like the natural scaffold, like freak out and form a scar to prevent like the whole rest of the brain from dying because cell death can be like this kind of cascading process. And so, so the glia, and, and it literally results in like a hole in the brain where the injury was. So I was looking at these bioengineered scaffolds that promote the growth of neurons across that hole. So, so like it'll it'll form a bridge or a, a structure, a scaffold for the neurons to grow. Uh, um, and then, you know, in terms of the, the societal um, setting, I think about um, scaffolding as infrastructure. And, and I mean, even in, in an organization, like you have to have bridges and roads and internet connections and utilities. And, you know, these things are, are it's the, the infrastructure that's necessary for kind of new um, branches or systems to start up. And even in like the farming terms, it's like, you know, the, the um, like, I, I don't know, here we just call them the ditches, but like the irrigation canals, I guess is probably the proper term. Like that, you know, the um, where you can, get a river to flow off into different um, subsections and then irrigate the farmland with that water. So, so I think about that as, as the scaffold. Awesome blue, nice connection. And sounds like cool PhD research. We see your screen, Stephen. So you see grassroots innovation program. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that was, that was yesterday. Um, well, the press release was in July, but it's not it's not detailing the book. But there we are. This is the um, so in South Africa there were the rate of unemployment is I think officially it's third more than thirty percent, but um, unofficially it could be as high as fifty percent. And uh, this is so they're now trying to address at least partly through this grassroots innovation problem program so one and there are there are similar and, and we know that um the book decades ago small is beautiful and uh gandhi was before that was promoting this but it does it's not scaling and so there are these um in between industrial production there's just this ever increasing wasteland but efforts are going on around the world and grassroots is a good term because it's uh, just growing from the evolving naturally doesn't it sounds like really yeah. interesting work thanks for sharing it steven select yeah actually that ties in i actually we were running a project in south africa funny enough um, and working on looking at how to create community-driven innovation through strate strategic conversations at the community level. And there is there is an interesting difference between grassroots, I think, and community-driven. So I, I think that grassroots is often kind of um, 
tied to it's like the base level of the organizational structures so you often hear it with political campaigns and stuff it's the grassroots but those grassroots are the grassroots of a campaign where people sort of get into there which is a little bit different to the kind of a community embedded community driven scale and that, that comes back to this scaling question which is the same thing that had the problems that so the scaling there's now when you talk about scaling up and that's a big challenge is how does stuff get scaled up and they often now talking as well about um scaling out if you have a program or scaling deep so you know some things might scale up because they go up to a higher level and then they basically get dropped down again <laughs> But how do these things get scaled out? So there may be some. I think you're you're t you're tapping into a few multi-level issues, which I think are quite quite important. So I wonder what your thoughts are about going at uh, going into these kind of embedded local context to create new seeds, so to speak, for like adaptability and innovation. It's like a seed is a biological planting metaphor. The scaffold is a um, highlighting the industrial component of a biological process. Like you still need the tomato seed. So it's not saying it's not community driven. It's just like a soil metaphor, like how these communicate what our vision is. And they really do matter. And so they're really um, important points. Actually, here's a comment from Kevin in the chat who wrote, is the scaffolding a schema or is this supposed to be anatomical? That is, is there some physiological analog in the human nervous systems or genome that corresponds to the scaffolding? I think Blue made an awesome point about the glia and about connective tissue being uh, an immune tissue being scaffolding physically for like the synapse and for cells. And then the genome, oh yes, the chromatin scaffolding goes deep in the nuclear pore structure. And that's a whole cool area and uh, Maybe there'll be a day for transcription factor active inference soon enough. So, um, what you were saying, Simon, these hands, this is a, an organization. Um, uh, active in Botswana. And everything uh, they're doing there. Oh, there we are, you can see. Yep. So what is home? So let me go there. Yep. So this is led by uh, Fabiso. And he, he's um, applying design methods in um, uh, communities in Southern Africa with great effect. And this is all, uh, and so the idea is that people are, with their own hands, are um, developing innovations, and as you say, it can be scaled out. So, oh, yeah, uh, scaling. So it's, it's almost. Uh, oh, guys. So it, they're all the um, so, for example, in in uh, that part of Africa, that there are many movements like uh, many initiatives going on, but it would be very beneficial if there was um, a framing, a kind of unifying framing of what they're all doing, which can be seen as an alternative an alternative form of socio-economic development rather than just as something that's uh well fundamentally inferior to industrial like to to the conventional model of industrialization so all suggestions are welcome.
I just put in the YouTube chat a volume uh, by Caporel, Grissomer, and Wimsat, Developing Scaffolds in Evolution, Culture, and Cognition. And so the paradigm change, as Stephen kind of hinted at very early, is like from systems where we eradicate the life to where we welcome the life and all that it brings. And we don't need to build that and we can't build it. We're not going to be able to compose the lipids and the millions of years of fault tolerances into some sort of, uh, you know, monster that helps our living systems. We don't even have to, though. We just have to build an engineered scaffold and the scaffold can be radically different than what the final product looks like. The scaffold can even disintegrate if it's biodegradable. So it um, it's a really interesting area that this discussion went, which was like towards the engineering that makes us think of like foundries and some of the technical and precision processes tying them to some natural processes like this evolution culture cognition volume does and unifying frameworks those uh together almost point away towards engineering a scaffold not a booster rocket or just a bunker but bunkers might come into play of doing some scaffold design so that there could be reduction of expected free energy through deep time so pretty interesting um, point, Stephen. Thanks for sharing all these resources too. Blue? Just a quick comment. Um, you were talking about the scaffolding disintegrating. Sometimes the scaffolding is designed to disintegrate. Like I think about in, in biological you know, terms, we have like webbing between our, our fingers that enable like the growth of the digits. And then, you know, it, it's designed to be eroded uh, in, in the developmental process. Um, so sometimes that's, that's part of it. Or even like when you get a wound sealed, you know, you have like the, the stitches that scaffold, that form the scaffolding. So the healing process can occur, but they dissolve inside the wound. Mm -hmm. actually that's a good that's quite cool to think about that as well in the processes and uh when when we whether in areas that we live in or areas that we don't live in when we plan to intervene are we planning to make something that sustains itself or are we planning to deliver or co-create a scaffold that is planned to disappear those are really different views on local and distal intervention. Stephen, with a screen share? What's on the screen, Stephen Fox? Yes, yeah, so, so now this is, um, this is an initiative called Connected Hubs. So this, this is coming from the Southern African uh, Innovation Support Programme. And uh, the idea is to um, that there are uh, hubs which support um, innovation and entrepreneurship. And these are this particular one is, um, so as you can see, the connectivities here in this part of Africa. And uh, what the idea is build capacities and support and uh, So it's connecting uh, different hubs together. And so a hub, it's just, what, what that means is it's just, that usually they've got a physical uh, location and they, uh, there are people you can contact there remotely and physically who've got, can help with developing um, ideas for, for entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. So this is something that's going on. Uh, it's connecting hubs. So maybe there's... Well, this is, hopefully this is, the intention is this persists after the Southern African Innovation Support Program. It's on the second phase now after it finishes. So this is one 
I suppose it's summed up in this uh, diagram here, this idea that there are more and more hubs in, and the European Commission is um, trying this uh, Africa EU digital innovation hubs. We'll see this and then and I have to. Yep. There we are. So this is kind of uh, things that are going on. So I'm involved in this project, sustainable um, network of digital innovation hubs. So that's something that's uh, coming down from the African Union and the European Union. And the hope, the aim is that this is an, uh, a somewhat new way of uh, um, facilitating socio-economic development and the idea is to try to get autocatalytic effects by you know more connections more um, more dynamism well they're always welcome to come talk about active inference at whatever stage <laughs> in the last few minutes we'll just have Stephen and then blue and yeah, just give kind of last yeah. thought, thought or question here as we close out. Okay, yeah, no, thanks. Very interesting. And um, I suppose with active inference, I think very interested in these these developments. It's actually how I ended up getting into this because I was trying to develop community-based hubs in South Africa, mm -hmm. funny enough, in rural, rural Maputa land. Um, and I think what's quite interesting is Daniel's, this, this idea of unifying framework rather than trying to reduce down all the complexity which is what i was doing for far too many years is really amazing and the other thing that all of these aspects that you're taught you've just shared and that ties in with this lab is it's it's about participation as soon as you bring in participatory processes you um you bring in these active inference dynamics you bring in this complexity you bring in this need but also the ability to do what mass um, manufacturing can't do. But like I thought you said, it's it's seen as being inferior or, or in our culture. And I think seeing it as being vital, but also challenging is really cool. So I think that's something I'm gonna take away because I can't, I won't actually be able to stay too much longer. I've got to jump on another call, but that's something I'd like to take away. So thanks very much. Brilliant, really, really enjoy today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. See you later. Blue? Um, so just a couple final thoughts. Uh, John Boyk and his idea of connected hubs. I mean, he was on like probably six different um, live streams and uh, he gave a very good overview of sustainability um, and the, you know, how to build an architecture toward a sustainable future. Uh, um, so the connected hubs kind of reminded me of that. And then, um, the one other thing was um, just about scaffolding and, you know, how do we build kind of a scaffolding for our cognitive architecture? A and is this a scaffolding that's maybe designed to dissolve? A and so I think about, you know, scaffolding for our cognitive architecture as as education, right? Like we send the kids to K-12 and they, you know, form this like shared understanding of reality and and two plus two is four and how to read books and so forth and this kind of um education maybe daniel will remember at, at least in college when i started college um in, in biology many things are so complicated that they just give you like a very broad overview that doesn't make sense or i was always searching for like but that doesn't make sense, but that doesn't make sense, like in your entry level classes. And, and then as you get like deeper and deeper into bi studying biology or biochemistry, you start to kind of understand electron transport and, and these different like things that are, are, are very like micro, but it, the macro level doesn't make sense without understanding that, that micro. And, and in my mind, this, this kind of educational or that way that I was taught in college was kind of like building a scaffold that was designed to disappear anyway. Um, but anyway, yeah, thanks for the for the talks today and for coming on. It was good.
if I can give my last comment and then to the author for the final comment, I just love this idea of the biochemistry education as the removable scaffold. Like you learn it once that there's the essential amino acids and then you never wonder like why on the nutrition label is there essential and non-essential? You forget the details, the side chains, you know, the C minus on the test, that all disappears with something that's generalized, but otherwise we would look at macroscopic phenomena. Like why can't I swim when there's this algae in the lake? Well, there's some molecular answer. We could know at least how to sense make in that area. I might even know the specific details, but also it can be removed in a way, but can it be removed intergenerationally? A chemistry to alchemy reversion with similar or different tools, that would be quite something. So Stephen, with the um, final notes, but just wanted to say thanks for coming on these streams. And it was just like super interesting discussions. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And um, I look forward to further uh, cooperation with you all. Great. If you or any of your collaborators on these projects or the, your um, contacts in these hubs wanted to present on this or facilitate in any way, then we can talk um, another time. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Stephen. Thank you, Blue. Bye.